Cases of Omicron, I'm sorry to tell you, are soaring, but I do have some good news. There's been a medical breakthrough. Researchers at Oregon State University believe they may have found a natural way to ward off the virus, and that natural way is cannabis. Cannabis compounds can prevent COVID-19 from infecting our cells. This would be interesting. You know, all this time we've been listening to the CDC, we should have been eating CBD. It <laughs> Thanks for the cold open, Jimmy. Many of you have probably heard of this research and are wondering if this is just another one of those chocolate cures cancer types of news. Well, today I'll be going over what the researchers did here and what it means for you. Welcome to DIY Biotech. As a brief disclaimer, I'm not a doctor. I mean, I sort of will be in about three years, but not that kind of doctor. I don't even research pharmaceuticals in my lab. I do genetic engineering and yeast. So this video is obviously not medical advice. And the data presented here is from in vitro studies. This means that chemicals were added to petri dishes of cells or tubes of proteins and the effects were studied. It takes years to take this kind of data and confirm that it is actually effective in humans. No, cannabis products don't cure every disease, but the plant does produce some interesting compounds that are of very interesting scientific value. About two thirds of small molecule drugs discovered since the 80s have been derived from plants. So querying cannabinoids for their capacity to qualm conditions is definitely worth the pursuit. Hopefully you're watching this in a future where COVID is a thing of the past, but until then, effective treatments and preventative measures are needed to slow the spread and reduce lethality. As of December, 2021, there have been about 300 million cases and 5 million deaths worldwide. No matter your stance on vaccines or treatments of this illness, it's clear we need to do something to stop the spread of this deadly disease. A new paper out of Oregon State University shows that a few compounds from the cannabis sativa plant may inhibit SARS-CoV-2 virus from entering your cells. CBDA and CBGA are in a group of compounds called cannabinoids that are beginning to be studied more for their pharmaceutical effects. This article shows through extensive experimentation that these two cannabinoids bind to the spike protein, preventing the virus from entering your cells. But first, what is a spike protein that everyone's talking about? Like a lot of proteins, it can be better understood when we break it down into functional subunits. The first one is pretty boring. It's called the transmembrane domain. It just helps the protein anchor into the outer shell of the virus. Next is the S2 subunit. It's a homotrimer, meaning it is made up of three identical subunits. Finally, there's the S1 subunit. This is the one we care about. It's a homotrimer like the S1 subunit and has the capacity to bind to the ACE2 receptor on your cells. If this S1 subunit of the spike protein cannot bind to your ACE2 receptors, then COVID infection can't happen. So how do we study if our cannabinoids can stop the docking of the spike protein into the ACE2 receptor? Magnets. Well, magnets are sort of involved. Since the S1 subunit is really all we care about, we can just start with that. We don't even need the whole HOMO trimer, we just need one of the monomers of the HOMO trimer. Next, we need something called a HIS tag. What this does is it helps us purify the S1 protein when we're trying to produce it. The HIS tag is pretty common and it just binds to a particular solid substrate so that we can isolate our S1 protein. Now, here's where we use the magnets. If we have a tiny magnetic particle that is in complex with the S1 and the HIS tag, we can pull this whole system out of solution and screen for particular chemicals that might bind to S1. So if something like CBDA binds to the S1 subunit here. Then when we use a magnet to pull this particle out of solution, we have this whole complex that we've pulled out, including the ligand that has bound to the S1 subunit. Then we can wash this complex with some sort of solvent and figure out what was attached to our S1 subunit. As a side note, CBDA is not CBD. CBDA is a naturally occurring compound produced in the plant, whereas CBD is CBDA that's been decarboxylated. 
If you have thoughts that CBD has the same effect as CBDA, since they're so similar, this paper shows evidence to the contrary. CBD, as well as many other cannabinoids, were tested, but CBDA and CBGA were the only ones with confirmed efficacy. So we're pretty confident that these chemicals can bind to the S1 subunit. But now we need to confirm this with actual cells and actual virus. These experiments are about as simple as you might expect. Add your chemical, mammalian cells, and SARS-CoV-2 virus to a petri dish and watch what happens. The watching part is what is a bit more complicated. The researchers in this paper used modified cells that glow green when they die. Additionally, they measured how much of the virus remained in the petri dish at the end of the experiment in the form of RNA. These two methods allowed the researchers to quantify cell death and viral infection, respectively. Various amounts of chemicals were used to determine how much CBDA or CBGA is needed to inhibit virus infection. These experiments did show promising results, but a significant quantity of the chemical was needed for there to be an effect. Typically, chemical concentrations are measured in micromolar, which is just micromoles per liter. Moles are a measure of how many molecules, so micromolar is measuring the number of molecules in a volume. Based on my understanding, anything greater than about 10 micromolar in these types of studies is usually not pharmaceutically relevant. In this study, it was shown that you need somewhere between about 30 and 300 micromolar to have an effect. But what do these numbers really mean? How much CBDA would you theoretically have to take to prevent COVID-19 infection? Let's do some math. So we want to reach somewhere between 30 and 300 micromolar of CBDA in our serum or blood. Some research in humans shows that consuming 0.063 milligrams per kilogram of body weight of CBDA gives us a serum concentration of 0.21 micromolar. So we can simply do 30 micromolar times 0.063 milligrams per kilogram gives us 0.21 micromolar. And the solution to this is that we need nine milligrams per kilogram of body weight. Nine milligrams of CBDA per one kilogram of body weight. Now, if you weigh about 150 pounds or about 68 kilograms, then we would need nine milligrams per kilogram times 68 kilogram body weight. And that gives us 612 milligrams of CBDA. So at a minimum, you need about 612 milligrams of CBDA to reach a serum concentration of 30 micromolar. Now, this is assuming a lot of things. First, it's assuming that you weigh 150 pounds, and also this is the low end. So on the high end, you would need more like six grams, six whole grams of CBDA to reach 300 micromolar CBDA in your blood. Additionally, our assumption that increasing CBDA consumption linearly increases the concentration in your blood is a very big assumption. These concentrations, 30 and 300 micromolar, are relatively large for blood concentrations. Um, and a lot of biological processes don't follow a linear pattern, as in, you know, if you eat more, you don't necessarily get a linear increase uh, of that compound in your blood. So that's a very, very big assumption here. But there could be a million different things that happen, like potentially if you eat a lot of CBDA, a lot of it is broken down or more of it is broken down the more you eat or maybe it accumulates in your blood and if you take some every single day then maybe your blood concentrations will build up over time and sort of plateau at a certain point who knows however this math does show that potentially you could do a clinical trial where participants are taking one or two grams of cbda per day to see what happens again these are in vitro studies, meaning they're just done in petri dishes, and there have been so many instances where transitioning from in vitro studies to in vivo studies, meaning in life, or in this case, in humans, 
does not translate there. You know, there are a million things that go wrong. Again, this is not medical advice. I'm not telling you to take this every day or that it will work or that it won't work. Uh, I'm just showing, you know, this research and a little bit of interesting math on, on how you would maybe set up uh, actual clinical trials for a pharmaceutical like this. This is a very promising research article that points in very specific directions for future studies. First, we need to find out if consuming larger amounts of CBDA actually increases blood concentrations to the micromolar range and for how long. Maybe that concentration can be achieved, but only for a peak within an hour. Or maybe CBDA stays in your blood for weeks and can accumulate if you take more every day. If these first results are promising, an experiment could be done to follow two groups of people. One group that takes a placebo and one that takes a couple of grams of CBDA every day, just for example. There's a multitude of examples of drugs that have worked in petri dishes, but failed to prove usable when tested on humans. With the data we have now, there is no evidence that CBDA or CBGA prevents COVID infection in humans. But this paper sheds some light on how cannabinoids may one day be shown to help our fight against SARS-CoV-2. Social distancing, masks, and getting vaccinated are the best tools we have to slow the spread of this deadly disease. If you enjoyed the video, leave a like and comment what you want me to cover next. Very soon, I'll be starting a series on genetically engineering yeast to produce cinnamon compounds. If you want to stay up to date on the channel content, please subscribe. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.